Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for How She Does It. On this show, we talk about all things women, money, and power. I'm Karen Feinerman. I had long known who our next guest was and had met her at various conferences and women-focused and Wall Street-focused or both events, but it wasn't until she and I found ourselves recruited to a Wall Street roast that had a mandatory dance number that we really had a chance to spend time together. If you don't know Melody, she's the president and co-CEL of Ariel Investments and one of Forbes' most powerful women in America. She's also on the board of JP Morgan and she's the chairwoman of Starbucks, making her one of the highest profile corporate directors in America. Before we get into the interview, I wanna make a quick announcement. Our podcast is now on YouTube. Subscribe to the At Her Money channel to get notified when new episodes come out and make sure to comment and like if you enjoy the episode. Melody, thank you so much for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I always love seeing you. Oh, thanks. All right, let's just jump right in. Tell us your story. You are the youngest of six children to a single mother. Where did it all begin? It all began in Chicago, where I'm from, a city that I still love and where Ariel is headquartered, my company. And I was born in Chicago. I'm the youngest of six. I'm really young in my family. My siblings are a couple decades older than me. Same mother, mm-hmm. different father. Mm-hmm. And um, my mom was industrious, worked so hard, did everything she could to provide, but often had a hard time. And so we had a life that was challenged at times, no harder than anyone else's. It's not to compare, but we did have a lot of experiences of getting evicted and our phone getting disconnected or lights Mm -hmm. turned off or all sorts of things that weren't great. But it really did establish the sense of focus in me and Mm -hmm. it gave me a lot of purpose. And I do tie my interest in money and being in the investment business to those early years where money was both mysterious, elusive, we never had enough, and it was a real struggle. And I wanted to understand money. And I thought if I could, I could have a better life. And so I, in some of the things I've read, your mother would talk to you about money in a way that some other parents wouldn't. I just wrote about this in Barron's. I I I read it. An article (laughs) on financial literacy. Yes, I. my mother made me aware of everything that was going on financially. And I think some people would grip their chest at that idea, even as a young child. I joke that some kids knew the price of candy and I knew what our rent was. She would show me bills. And it wasn't to burden me. It was really to help me understand oftentimes the circumstances that we were in. And it gave me a total understanding in a very different way than I think most kids of what it costs to live, truly costs. Mm -hmm. I remember there were times we were really, really broke and she would go to full service gas stations used to exist where there would be a gas attendant. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know why this memory comes to me, but my mom would drive me to school, which was not close by. And she would Mm -hmm. go to the gas station attendant and she would ask if she could borrow $5 worth of gas to get me to school. Now you think about that today of what a gallon of gas costs, but my mom would help me to understand how much gas $5 was, which wasn't Mm -hmm. a lot, but it was enough to get us to school. And gas was obviously much cheaper at that time than it is today. Mm -hmm. But those were the actual conversations we had. The other thing she did whenever we went to any restaurant from McDonald's to a diner that she loved, I always paid the check always. Uh Literally put the money, counted out the money. Uh When I remember her going to the bank to deposit a check and she said and showed me how I must always look and make sure that the receipt represents the account number. And she said, you have to make sure it's going in your account. My mom would do these things. And I mean, I didn't really understand at the time how profound it would be because she wasn't actually great with money, believe it or not. Uh Uh, My mom wanted you to be. My mom would buy mm-hmm. Easter dresses instead of pay the light bill, but she did want she did want to make sure that I understood everything. So I know this, is, as you said, it's important to you. And I know in the Barron's article, for example, you talked about what you want to teach your daughter. And obviously she's in a different financial circumstance than you were. But what do you feel like I have to get her to understand this? Which part of it? 
Well, I think this issue is something that is important for all parents, if you have a lot or you don't have a lot. And I think this idea of teaching kids about money comes with a lot of trepidation for parents. Those who have scarcity feel that it's going to make the child anxious. And those who have abundance think it's going to make the child lazy, potentially. Mm -hmm. And I just don't believe either of those scenarios. I've had scarcity. I've had abundance in my life. I've also seen my child grow up and she is not in the circumstance I was in by any stretch, but I do believe she needs to understand. She needs to be aware. And so I'm, I'm not necessarily sitting down with her and showing her we don't have rent. We, we <laughs> own our house, right. but I am sitting down and I'm explaining a lot of things about money to her. When we go to stores, I always make her pay. I give her the credit mm -hmm. card. I have her put it down. I have her look at the receipts. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we play games of, we, she loves Sephora. So uh -huh. when she's going to Sephora, I have her look at the prices and we get to the counter and I say, guess how much the bill is going to be for mm -hmm. her to really understand what things cost. She has this game that she likes to play on her iPad and she'll ask me if she can buy, a, she calls it a place. And I've started to teach her how I won't say yes, just to 99 cents and uh -huh. just things like that, that just giving her a sense of value, what it costs mm -hmm. to earn something and you know why this is all very important. The other day we were at McDonald's and she asked me about taxes. She said, uh -huh. explain tax to me. And I literally, uh -huh. she's like, is it on everything? I said, yes. Were you and then thrilled? I explained, oh my God. She I then explained it. to her the differences between taxes in states and then taxes on your income. And mm -hmm. I explained to her how you work for several months without getting paid technically because you're paying taxes. And mm -hmm. she's like, literally, they don't yeah. pay you? I said, no, they pay you. Mm -hmm. But that's how many months you work um, that right. you have to pay the society. And explained to, her, explained to her the whole thing. It was fascinating. I love doing it. We're having so much yeah. fun. And this Christmas, I'm buying her her first stocks. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know you're value oriented. So you're going to pick something for the long run. I do find it interesting that what you're saying about parents shielding their children, they just, don't, they, they have no sense of it. And I don't think you're doing them a favor either way. It's funny. My colleague one time, his, this is a while ago, his young son came in and said, daddy, show me how you win money from the screen. And it was just so surreal. You know, they can't imagine how you make money and what to do with it. And it's so great that you're- And it's so much harder that. today because first of all, kids see ATMs and credit mm -hmm. cards. So the mm -hmm. finality of money doesn't have the same meaning, especially to a small child that doesn't understand money being spit out of a machine. It seems <laughs> free. Right. And so just to explain all of this, or credit cards don't seem real. So there are a lot of reasons to get very specific about it. In the early years, I suggest people with young kids use cash so they can see the finality of it. Right. I know that symbolism is really important to a kid, I think. All right. So tell me about your relationship with John, who I think of as your work husband, John Rogers. I'm talking <laughs> That's what about. Jamie Dimon calls him. Yes. I've worked with John Rogers, who founded Ariel for. 32 years, soon to be 33. That's amazing. I've only had one job. <laughs> yes, I joke with John, you know, I've lasted longer than most of the other people, uh, including a couple of marriages on his side. But I, um, John and I have a, just a unique partnership and we're co-leaders. I started off as a pipsqueak. I was an intern mm -hmm. and I moved up through the organization I was president for over 20 years, and in 2019, I became co-CEO. And I wonder why there aren't more co-leaders. There are co-CEOs mm -hmm. at KKR, but it's not a title that you hear. And I joke with people, most people don't grow up and say, I wanna be a co-CEO, <laughs> but there's, it's, we can divide and conquer. We can cover mm -hmm. so much more ground together. You have a partner. I joke that when one of us is up and the other one is down, we shore each other up and mm -hmm. we just try to make sure we're not down at the same time. <laughs> right. so we, you have a shoulder to lean on mm -hmm. and we divide our responsibilities. But I can't say enough good things about John because John started Ariel and then shared the reins, not handed mm -hmm. them over, uh -huh. shared them. That's extremely mm -hmm. rare that especially a founder can do that easily. And I think mm -hmm. it's a function of a great deal of trust. And honestly, I have to say love that we have for each other. I tell people all the time, mm -hmm. I love John. John mm -hmm. is like a family member to me. He's Everest's godfather. And we've 
grown up in this business together in so many ways, even though he's 11 years older than me. So I, I, it's such an unusual and amazing partnership. And I don't think I've seen anything quite like it. But I remember one time, this was several years ago, seeing you talk about your relationship with John through the very difficult period of 2008, which if you're in the money management business, 2008 was the most treacherous I, I, I've ever been in. And the way you talked about how each of you were like, I should have done this, I should have done that. And there was never any finger pointing except at yourselves. And that's a really unusual and it's a very graceful way to go about it because when times are really tough, it's hard to say this was on me. And I just thought that was a We always example. believe in Ariel of taking 100% responsibility. And both of us took 100% responsibility for that outcome, which was tough. I mean, I can barely talk about it without welling mm -hmm. up, I have to tell <laughs> you. It still leaves a mark. But it was also a time of, we were in a trench together and it was a time of great bonding. And mm -hmm. that, that solidified our devotion to each other uh -huh. because it was so hard. And the loyalty and trust that we solidified during mm -hmm. that period has served us through other difficult times and will serve us through life. And we never blamed each other. I felt like from the perspective of the top time we had, I could have d done a better job explaining to clients what to expect from us and how we invested. John felt like he could have picked better stocks during that time. And I kept saying, no, it's not your fault, it's my fault. And he kept saying, no, it's not <laughs> your fault, it's my fault. And um, uh, that was great for our team to see because mm -hmm. there was never any, we weren't upset with each other. We were, I felt I needed to support him mm -hmm. and he felt like he needed to support me. And so it was, it was an important time. I hated it in every way, mm -hmm. but I value it in every way since then. Right. And it got us, you know, that was helpful during getting through COVID, having mm -hmm. had that experience before. We're resilient now. We know how to be in a trench. Mm -hmm. And so I do appreciate the challenge and the difficulties of that period, even though I, I hope not to relive them. Right. I do. I do think it's one of the great lessons of taking blame allows other people to relax and try to fix the problem instead of trying to scramble to not get blamed. I found just take the blame. It's interesting. It's and, and it's all how you see it. I just we just had an issue the other day with something and with another colleague and I put in the email, our general counsel received the email. I said, 100% my fault, all me. I do that to also lead our people to see they can, they can take responsibility for something not going well, it's actually better. Mm -hmm. I find that it takes all the tension and hair out yes, of the room. Right. And then people aren't so defensive or feeling mm -hmm. like, and even if it's not, I still say it. Right. I do think, yeah, it, it shows them, yes, you can take blame and it totally frees people up to me. I okay, find move people, on. I have more respect for that person. Yes. I really yes. do. And most people won't say they made a mistake. It's just the craziest <laughs> thing or know. they don't know an answer. I remember <laughs> my husband saying something to me once about General Milley and General Milley coming on TV after having done something and he came on TV and he said, I shouldn't have done that. And George, mm -hmm. my husband said to me, he's like, look at that. No one mm -hmm. does that anymore. Mm -hmm. And he's like, that's a great leader. And I thought, wow. Yeah. You know, that is a the great mere leader. fact that it's rare. Yes. That brings me to another point, which is being on the boards of Starbucks and JP Morgan. You're the chairwoman of the Starbucks board and JP Morgan, which are two of the most iconic companies in the world. And by the way, I love Jamie Dimon so much, I can't even tell you. He knows. But when you see him at the next board meeting, tell him I said hi, but he knows. Jamie is um, a very special leader. Jamie is the kind of leader who on a conference call, I remember he said, and Jamie likes to use somewhat colorful language sometime. It, it was, uh, you know, they had screwed up something and someone asked, are other banks going to have this trouble? And he said, if you're asking if they're as stupid as we are, I don't know. I can only speak for us. It's classic Jamie. He's like, and classic. sometimes we're going to step in dog do and we're going to try not to do that very often. And yes. I just think, why don't other leaders, it's such a positive to say it. I don't understand why other leaders don't say we made a mistake. But so what I, have you learned? from? Oh, my God, I've learned so much from him. I have to tell you the first story, <laughs> my first day 
at <laughs> on the board of JP Morgan. And, um, you know, I was very excited. I walked into the bank. I'm saying hi to everyone. And I say, it's my first day of school. That's what I kept <laughs> saying to everyone. So I get, they say, Jamie wants to see you in his office for a few minutes before the board meeting. And JP Morgan is Mecca if you're Ariel. This is the largest bank in America, the eighth largest bank in the world. And so I get into the meeting and I tell him we're just chit chatting. And I said, my husband, is going to change banks. And my husband mm -hmm. had only ever been at the same bank for 40 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. And I said, my husband is going to change banks. And he said, oh, he says, well, I want to know how that goes. Now I'm thinking <laughs> he's just being polite, right? Uh -huh. So I'm like, yeah, Jamie, I'm really going to call you and report back <laughs> on him changing banks. And he says, no, I want you to understand something. These things can be difficult, especially someone like your husband. And mm -hmm. he said, I want to know how it goes, because if something goes wrong, that meant it affected 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. That one thing, it, I magnify it. And I thought, I was like, that is someone that is so focused on excellence that he really mm -hmm. sort of thought through every experience. And then how does that experience translate to the vast numbers of people that we serve? Now, nothing went wrong, I should say that. <laughs> and it was all great. But mm -hmm. I just thought the insight that he was looking mm -hmm. for wherever he could get it was something yeah. that was very, very important. And so mm -hmm. I've learned a lot from him, especially doubling down on what doesn't go well. He doesn't want to mm -hmm. sit and have high fives around victory laps. Uh -huh. It's more about what could we do better? And I think that's why they are so good. And that's why mm -hmm. he's attracted such an outstanding leadership team around him. He has all stars in every corner mm -hmm. of that place. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is unbelievable to meet the leaders mm -hmm. there because any of them on their own are exceptional and could be running you know, major institutions. Uh -huh. And so and it's some great of them to, will actually. And, yes. But it's great <laughs> to see they want to be with him mm -hmm. and they see his leadership as being an opportunity to learn as I do as well. And hopefully an opportunity to contribute. Mm -hmm. And how about at Starbucks? Also another iconic company that's had some ups and downs, had some leadership changes. What have you learned from there? Well, I've been in a boardroom or I was in a boardroom for a long time with Howard Schultz. Mm -hmm. And Howard Schultz as the founder of the company. I mean, there's there are few people who have built what he has done in the histories <laughs> of business. We're in 82 countries, 34, 35,000 restaurants. There's nothing like it. 450,000 or so people. And the fact that it is an iconic brand in the way that it is, there's so much to learn there. I always joke, I always sat to the right of Howard, always, mm -hmm. years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And I know this sounds crazy and maybe even a little creepy, mm -hmm. but whenever someone spoke and he wrote something down, I wanted to think to myself, why is he writing that down? Mm -hmm. So it's like, what is he hearing? Right. That I should hear Did differently. Did you look at his least. notes? I didn't look at his notes, <laughs> but I would be very curious about what uh, he would feel the need. What prompted to, him to write. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. think a lot more about it. But I learned so much from Howard and just how to run a business with values being at the core of who you are mm -hmm. and putting your people first at all times. The people so, and the customer. And JP Morgan, the same thing. Starbucks, mm -hmm. the same. I mean, uh, DreamWorks. Estee Lauder, these are why these are great brands, because mm -hmm. they do the right thing. Do you think that kind of leadership can be taught or is it, are you born with it? Is it innate? I think you're born with courage and vision. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you teach it. I've seen some courageous leadership in some of the rooms that I've been in where I'm like, a lot of people can be Monday morning quarterbacks, but very few people in the moment when it's really hard will make the hard decision. And that is hard to teach, hard. Mm -hmm. I haven't figured out how to teach it myself, except uh -huh. to help people to understand that as long as you don't have a fatal failure is okay. Mm -hmm. But most people as from what we talked about already, they're not comfortable with that being uncomfortable. So the vision part, it, the same thing. You either have it or you don't. Some people have great vision. I think Howard, you know, when you think about what coffee was then and what it is now. That I can't even remember what pre- Folgers. Yes. You know, oh, like okay. that, was, that was coffee. 
<laughs> All right. Okay. No wonder I didn't think of it because that's probably not a product I would have used. All right. So I do know that you did do a master class and yes. you talk about decision making. And I think this needing a process is it, it, it almost doesn't even matter what exactly the process is. It's about how do you make what is the format that allows you to make good decisions? And I think it's such an important lesson to teach that there there are, are some nuts and bolts of it that are really important. Gathering information and comparing alternatives and seeking you know, input. And yes. pivoting when you need to. I mean, one of my favorite lines from Warren Buffett, champions adapt. Mm -hmm. Adapting when you need to. Sometimes you have a plan and the plan as it plays out, doesn't make sense anymore. You know, I, we read this book during the 0809 crisis called Deep Survival. A lot of people read that book by Lawrence Gonzalez. And he talks about what does it take to survive in a terrible moment? And one of the things he says is rigid people are dangerous people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you get too rigid when you're in a plan, a strategic mm -hmm. plan especially, it can really sink you. So you have to be able to pivot. And I do believe in seeking out input. I don't think that is a sign of weakness. I think it's a sign of strength. A lot mm -hmm. of people won't ask for help. You mm -hmm. know, I, I have so many lifelines I can dial. <laughs> you know? uh, I really, I, and I have no problem doing it. I always think of the Mike Tyson line, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. It's true. And, right. Yeah. It's how do you, how do you write your ship? You know, Correct. how do you write, write the ship? Um, all right, we're going to have to take a quick break and we'll be right back. And we're back with Mariel Hobson. Mariel. <laughs> I'm, I don't know what I was thinking. And we're back with Melody Hobson. Okay. You are perhaps uh, the most highly visible, most respected black woman in corporate America. What, what does that mean to you as an opportunity? I would say that it's a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the responsibility is one I take very seriously. And I know everything emotes. And so I'm very, I hopefully I'm very authentic. I'm not living my life for other people, but I'm very cognizant of the fact that people watch me and they watch me in ways that might affect their thinking. And so I want to be really responsible. And that mm -hmm. comes in all sorts of forms and fashion, things that I will do, things that I won't do. I do speak my truth. I think that's extremely important, but I say it's my truth. And in that situation, it's truth with a small T, not a capital T, mm -hmm. because my truth doesn't mean it's what you believe. And I can be okay with that, having a different set of beliefs than you, but not being willing to compromise on my values. I, I do know um, that I could make it easier or harder for people who come after me and easier if there's a sense of not having some expectation that we can't be excellent, you know, and, and so that's why I put a lot into not perfection, but a but striving to be as excellent as I can possibly be, recognizing I'm going to make mistakes and I'm human, but trying really hard. I mean, trying really, really hard. And then so, the, the one last thing I would say is that I think that I want to make sure that I break people's mental models. They have an idea mm -hmm. sometimes of what a leader look, should look like, should dress like, should be like. And at times I want to just tell them your idea then constricts your reality. And it doesn't allow for for more or other or different. And so maybe if you meet me and I'm a little bit different, your idea shifts mm -hmm. and that that becomes the opportunity opens for others. And I don't say that in terms of some sort of explicit bias. I just mean it in terms of not even recognizing at times. Mm -hmm. It's it's a unique role that you're in. Tell us about Project Black, which is an ambitious endeavor and people might not know about it. So we started a private mm -hmm. equity business and we started a fund that closed earlier this year, early in 2023. And our goal is to scale sustainable minority businesses by two, bringing two things together, capital and customers. A lot of this idea was born of a phone call from Jamie Diamond. Jamie mm -hmm. called me during the summer of 2020 after the horrific murder of George Floyd. And he said, a lot of people want to help black businesses. And he started to brainstorm some things that they were thinking about. And I said, I think I have a really good idea. 
So I went home and I wrote a memo over a weekend. And in the spirit mm -hmm. of investment banking, I gave it a pseudonym and I called it Project Black. And I sent it to him <laughs> and it was this idea of could we do something that had never been done before, which was to buy middle-sized businesses, middle mid-market businesses that may not necessarily be minority owned when we buy them, but by virtue of our ownership at Ariel, become minority owned businesses that ultimately become tier one suppliers to Fortune 500 companies, the essential workers for the Fortune 500 companies, allowing those businesses to grow. This was based upon the fact that when we looked at the data, 95% of black and brown businesses in this country have less than $5 million in revenue, no. 95%. Only five black businesses in the United States have more than a billion dollars in revenue. So if you're a major Fortune 500 company and you want to diversify your supply chain, which many people wanted to do post COVID literally and figuratively, literally because of some of the supply chain problems that they have, figuratively as well because of recognizing maybe they hadn't been as inclusive in their vendor selection as they should have been. If you wanted to do it, you didn't have businesses of scale to work with. Mm -hmm. And no corporation wants to write a hundred different $2 million purchase orders. They'd right. like to write a $200 million purchase order. But if you don't have the businesses of scale to be able to handle that opportunity, we can't change society, change, narrow the wealth gap, change the way people think about business. We, instead of people thinking about minority businesses being small and disadvantaged, we want there to be a day when they think of minority businesses being large and advantaged. And the reason that is profound is because as you have that, that equity and that opportunity ripple through the community, you narrow the wealth gap and create a stronger society. Mm -hmm. It's such an unusual, unique approach to sort of take a middle market, as you said, and really, I mean, there's a lot of leverage there in which it, it's sort of a, once I read it, I'm like, oh, that makes perfect sense. And I hadn't ever considered that before. It's always a focus on, all right, let's start, let's start really from small. the very small. And, and the how do we build that up? It's, but the, if you, yes, but if you start really small, it's literally decades until anything happens. And mm -hmm. so we just kept saying, we, there are a bunch of people doing small, but we said, let's go big or go home. Literally. <laughs> right. And so let's, it's... let's do it in a way that no one has ever done it before. And, when I, considering all of the private equity funds and everything that has been done, when I went to people, they were they literally looked at me and they said, we never thought of this. Right. It was an yeah. original idea. I think the most brilliant ideas are in hindsight, so obvious, and yet nobody has ever looked at them that way. And wow, that is fantastic. So you're, what, you're not even quite one year in. I know you've done- Right, we've, bought, it, we've bought three companies. <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. So our first company is a company called Sorensen Communications. They provide tech-enabled services for the deaf and hard of hearing. And mm -hmm. they're the largest in their area and their field. It's a perfect business for us. We're very, very excited. We're very excited about the growth opportunities. A lot of their business has been B2B, where people provide those services to employees. Deaf and hard of hearing employees have much lower turnover than the traditional employee base, but we see great opportunities to provide that to customers, to provide language translation. There are a lot of opportunities with Sorensen that still exist. Um, then we recently bought a business last week called MyCode, mm -hmm. and MyCode is a multicultural advertising related business mm -hmm. that targets specific communities, Hispanic communities, women, Asian community, et cetera. And they provide direct marketing related opportunities to those communities. And so big brands use my code to get to customers that they want. And we, again, mm -hmm. perfect aerial business for us to own. Great leadership based in Los Angeles. Sorensen's based in Salt Lake City. And we just have great plans for these businesses. We think that they're at the beginning of a great journey. Mm -hmm. So you're off, you're off and running. Yeah, good we are off you. and running, so it's good. Fantastic. All right, I have one more question before before we get to the lightning round. It's sort of a, a, it's not philosophical, but I'm very interested in your answer. So you have this amazing story. You are a self-made woman, tremendously hardworking woman, and yet, and you find yourself at the nexus of power and wealth and glamour. You have your husband is George Lucas, for those who don't know, the creator 
of Star Wars and you have a beautiful daughter. And I wonder to that little girl that was you who knew how much the rent was, did you think this is the kind of life that you would end up leading? So first of all, I don't think anyone is self-made. I want to say that. Yeah. I think I'm a composite of a lot of people who poured their hearts into me. My family, teachers, working with John Rogers, Howard Schultz. I could just go on and on with people who I think really invested in me. So many friends that are mutual friends of ours. So I just don't believe in that concept. I don't think anyone is self-made, truly. But, but the, hard do, working is, the hard working is, is yes. true. I cannot work mm -hmm. anyone. I mean, I really, I do pride myself in my work ethic. I did learn that work ethic from my mother. I would say that realistically, there is no way that I could foresee this life that I have. And I'm so humbled by it. I am aghast at times at my own life. <laughs> and I am amazed. And I just feel such gratitude for uh -huh. things big and small that it would be hard for most people to even imagine. There are days I wake up. I'm just so grateful to have a place to live. I'm mm -hmm. so grateful to be able to pay my bills. I know that sounds crazy because I've lived in situations where we literally couldn't, mm -hmm. where we were just trying to piece together an existence. And it lives inside of me in a very well, well way that I've never been able to walk off. And so that part I couldn't imagine. I feel gratitude for all the greatness around me that I can learn from my own husband, who's one of the wisest people I've ever met in my life. And I sit there and say, wow, I'm so lucky I could learn that nugget today from him. Uh -huh. And so, no, it's not imaginable. But what I will say, I refuse to have the life that I had before. I knew it as a child. And mm -hmm. I started to focus in a way that it would be impossible for most people to understand. Mm -hmm. I was laser focused on a better life. And so I used to do things that were just so crazy that, you know, like what we like, I didn't have anywhere to do my homework. So I sat in the mm -hmm. bathroom and I used mm -hmm. the toilet Do as, it as desk, a desk uh -huh. and I sat there <laughs> for hours, uh -huh. hours, yeah. hours. And my house was really noisy sometimes. And so, mm -hmm. you know, no one will like the story probably, but I would run the <laughs> tub water to drown out the noise uh -huh. so that I could, could, so that I could think uh -huh. quietly. So, wow. you know, just things that it would be hard for anyone to understand, but where I said, I have to focus. I was talking to some athletes recently and I said, you know, how you knew you were the out for your entire family, that everyone, your community was mm -hmm. counting on you. That's how I felt. All right. We're going to take a quick break and be back with the lightning round. Okay. And we're back with the lightning round. So this is just, would you rather, you just got to just top of your head. What is the... Okay, got All it. All right, which you choose. Here we go. Okay. Underdressed or overdressed? Overdressed. I knew you would say that. I know you love clothes. Okay, that was a layup. Would you rather laugh uncontrollably or be moved? Wow, that's hard. I'm going to go for be moved. Okay. Uh, would you rather drive or be driven? Be driven. Black tie or barbecue? Black tie. Chicago or Northern California? Chicago. Okay, you're a Chicago girl. All right, Han Solo or Luke Skywalker? Han Solo. <laughs> that wasn't even close. Okay, uh, modern art or old masters? Modern art. A good book or a good movie? I'm going to go for the movie. Okay, for the book then. Uh, fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. Okay, what are you reading right now? I just got one of Simon Sinek's books. Nice. Simon Sinek is that, you know, he's that person on leadership and development. The Infinite Game. Mm -hmm. The Infinite Game is yeah. the new book. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Last one. What is the best investment you've ever made and the worst investment you've ever made? Any definition of investment is fine. The best investment I've ever made, this is going to be such a cliche but it's actually not going to be financial. It's in the relationships that I have. I think it takes time, energy, and a real commitment. And I've had people in my life that are so important to me that I really feel grateful that I made the effort. The That's worst great investment answer. I ever mm -hmm. made was, it's so funny, all of my money is in Ariel. <laughs> worst investment I ever made. Right. There are a couple of companies that I invested in that didn't do well. 
And I think they were related to something that I don't do, which is they weren't value stocks. They were hot stocks at the moment. Uh Okay. I do think there's something about you have a good decision process and sometimes it doesn't work out. And that doesn't mean you made a bad decision. No, it's absolutely true. And the reverse is true. You could have a bad process, but it worked out. And you can't mistake that for for a good process. Correct. And thinking you're smart. Yeah. Yeah. But, process is very mm-hmm. important. And your how you make a decision, as long as you consistently mm-hmm. apply that that point of view. And the, the example that I can give you of where I had a bad decision, it was I, I let go of some of my rules. Mm-hmm. So. All right. Well, Melody, I am so thankful for your time. I know you don't have very much of it at all, but uh, thank you for spending the time with me. And... Thank you for having me. And you know, I'm a fan of yours. I oh, love seeing you, you on television and I <laughs> have learned so much from you over the years and I appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Right back at you. I mean, you are a model for so many women. <laughs>